Yes, Wayne Groom and Dr. Caroline Bils Billsborough, who are the um, uh, producers, writers, cinematographers for uh, the wonderful documentary on Marjorie Lawrence, The World at Her Feet. Um, Wayne is, is a distinguished filmmaker going back a long time. <laughs> 42 <laughs> years. Yes. <laughs> and if you don't know what he's done, I, I suggest that you go and look him up. It's, a, it's an extensive and very interesting career that he's had uh, in the industry. Um, and Caroline is, a, is a, a lecturer at South Australia, University of South Australia, um, with a focus on, on media and in particular documentaries. Um, and she is also, as a sideline, she's also a cinematographer and, and editor. Um, and her work, I, I'm assuming that's your work, that's in the in the film, doing all the all the interspersing and cutting. Correct. Um, look, I'm I'm not going to say very much more, um, other than to hand over to you. And for everybody, please um, uh, mute yourselves and also maybe cameras off. That allows for better um, better reception as well. We will be having questions um, and commentary at the end of the presentation, which will be about with 30, 40 minutes, more or less. Um, so save your, save, your, save your questions till then. Okay, over to you. Thank you, Esteban. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming along. Um, it was great to hear that many of you uh, went to see the film on the weekend, uh, so we're eager to hear your thoughts. So we'll, we'll do that at the end. We'll have, have some time left over, hopefully, for some questions. So note them down uh, as we go through. Uh, so what we're going to do today is uh, run you through the making of the film. Um, as filmmakers, you know, we love going on the journey of, of documentary. It's it's a great adventure. So uh, Marjorie was, was no different and the magic that comes along the way, we'd like to share that with you today. Uh, so Wayne and I have been working together, making documentaries of, of this historical nature um, for 10 years. I can't believe 10 years has gone so quickly. Um, so our first film together uh, was uh, Paris or the Bush. Uh, and I'll just briefly tell you, it's, um, it's about the, the Murray Cods rowers. So a group of eight rowers from Murray Bridge regional town, obviously on the Murray River here in South Australia. And in 1924, they represented Australia at the Paris Olympics, um, which was extraordinary to have one tiny club crew go over to Paris and, and represent the whole country. Um, phenomenal story. Much like Marjorie, it had been forgotten. Um, no book had been written for the CODs, so we spent many years uh, working through the research of, of that film and, and we produced that as our first work. And since then we've gone on and made a, a, a film about the Somerton Man, the famous mystery um, from South Australia. And as Wayne mentioned uh, to some of you who came early um, in 2018, we followed a group of cyclists through uh, London um, all the way through to Villiers Bretonneux in France um, for the 100 year am armistice celebrations um, back in 2018. We documented their journey through the, the Western Front, the battlefields from World War One. So that is what we do. Um, over to Wayne to give a, a little history of where he's come from. So I began uh, my career as a civil engineer. So I graduated from Adelaide University and after about three years I decided that I wanted to make films but I had no idea uh, how that could happen. So I eventually just gave up my job and uh, and began to seek work in the, in the film industry. So at the time it seemed like a very, very reckless decision but in retrospect now it's been a tremendous journey through film uh, and uh, I've enjoyed every moment of it. Uh, financially, it hasn't been as uh, as good as if I'd stayed an engineer, but I'm happy with the way things are. Uh, so, in I was making feature films and television series and documentaries for many years, and then uh, what was it? Ten years ago, I met Carolyn, and she had written her PhD about the transition from 20th century filmmaking to 21st century filmmaking. And I realised when I saw her PhD that I was still operating in the 20th century, um, which meant getting big crews, getting a lot of money investment to make films. But what she said was this is a creative century and your costs can be low now in making films. Your returns are going to be much lower, but you have freedom to be an artist, basically, instead of having this big load of investment money. So it was a, it was a great moment, and since then we formed a team, and uh, basically we swap roles. Sometimes she directs, sometimes I do. Uh, 
uh, she's a great editor, so I don't do the editing. She knows exactly what she's doing there. So it's been a tremendous journey, and um, I can only say, you know, making films, we have got to meet so many wonderful people. It's been just an experience, uh, not only here in Australia, but uh, overseas as well. And the Marjorie Lawrence story has been the best of, of them all. So it's been, it's been great fun. So to get started on our uh, filmmaking journey, we'd just like to share the opening of the film um, in case there are some people that haven't seen the film, just to give you some uh, context about about our, our work that we've just completed. Um, so I will share the screen and choose this. So this is the opening of Marjorie Lawrence, The World at Her Feet. <laughs> Yes, I have, Eleanor, and I was just as excited by the movie as I was by the actual events as they occurred in my life. I'm sorry, excuse me, just a moment, Mr. Albert Martin, and uh, Miss Marjorie Lawrence, yeah. how do you do? Uh, I'm Ralph Edwards, and uh, instead of this being a TV trailer film for a mighty wonderful picture, as you two thought, uh, millions are watching you right now on television across the nation, right at this very moment. Now, your trip here was arranged at our request so that we might tell the nation your great, great story. This is your life, Marjorie Lawrence. <laughs> oh, my goodness. In 1955, Marjorie Lawrence was one of the most loved celebrities in the USA. Her fame initially came from her extraordinary voice. She graced the opera theatres of urban and regional France, winning widespread acclaim before being lured to New York to perform at the famous Metropolitan, the home of opera in the USA. She sang at the White House for President Roosevelt, later becoming his personal friend, entertained the Queen and the Princesses Elizabeth and Margaret at Buckingham Palace, and received the Légion d'Honneur from the French government. Marjorie became arguably the most famous Australian woman in the world. Her rise to fame from rustic farm girl growing up in country Victoria to a star of global opera is one of the most astonishing feats in Australian music history. Yet today, few people remember her name nor the scope of her international fame and remarkable life. In Winchelsea, dedicated archivists work tirelessly to keep the memory of Marjorie alive. But the question remains, why has Marjorie been forgotten? Okay, so that's the opening. We'll show you one more clip from later in the film, a little bit later in our talk. So Wayne. Where did you get started on this film? Yes, well, I think in January 2020, we were looking for something to do. And uh, I went to see a friend of mine, Louise Wood Woodcock, who, uh, with her husband, Ron Woodcock, travelled the world uh, playing concerts. Uh, they're retired now. Uh, but chatting to Louise, she said, I've got a book you might want to read. And I looked at it, and it had... Um, uh, Marjorie Lawrence on the on the front cover of Richard's uh, Richard's book um, in full Brunhilde um, uh, outfit, and I sort of thought to myself, mm, not sure that I'm going to be. I'm not really a great opera fan, uh, but she said, look, I think it's a good book. I think you might like it. Just just give it a try. So I took the book to be kind to her, I suppose. Got home and started reading it, and I couldn't put it down. I was absolutely transfixed and Richard's uh, meticulous 
investigation of her life and then the stories and the way he presented the stories for those of you who read the book you, you'll know what I mean I just I just read it over about three or four days I think I just kept wanting to get back to it all the time so once I discussed it with Carolyn I said well I think this story can work but we were both insecure because we didn't know enough about opera so we thought how are we going to do this uh, we decided just to plunge into it and see what happens so I went to see Michael Bollan at uh, Wakefield Press. He was he published um, uh, Richard's book, and I sort of knew knew Michael. And uh, I said, you know, could we get to Richard Davis and see whether he might let us make a documentary of his book? So Michael facilitated that, and uh, uh, he came back and said, look, he lives in the Gold Coast, and he'd be happy to see you if you came up. So suddenly we thought, okay, we're on this journey. Who knows where it's going to lead to? Uh, and I immediately booked some flights uh, from... Uh, and Louise Woodcock had given us some money to get started because she wanted to see this film made as well. So we were able to book some flights to the Gold Coast in uh, ready to go in March to start. Of course, then, then COVID intervened. Yeah, so this is March 2020, which, you know, is ingrained in all of our minds now as being uh, the time where the world changed very much. So uh, every, everything was shut down, obviously, flights were all cancelled and we were all put on ice uh, for the next at least four or five months. So we bided our time and kind of just did a little bit of groundwork that we could, some, some desktop research, finding photos and things. And it wasn't until September uh, 2020 that we were actually finally able to get onto a plane and head to the Gold Coast to meet Richard. We had to go through, because there was still, I think we were actually the first flight to Brisbane yes, after yes. the lockdowns, we were yeah. lucky enough to get on that. So then we had to get the, the train down to Gold Coast um, and, and meet Richard. Um, and what a wonderful person he was. Um, we spent two days interviewing Richard. Um, obviously, he was going to become the spine of our story, having done so much research. Um, and he was so generous with his time. He gave us three hours on one day and then came back the very next day to give us another three-hour interview. Um, and he was such a wonderful storyteller. Um, and I think the success of the film is, is, is partly due to, to that spine that he gives the story. It was funny, actually, because, you know, he was a little bit ginger at first. He didn't really know us, and he was going to be handing over his book to these filmmakers who might do a terrible job or a good job he didn't know. So he was a bit reserved when he first came. Uh, and um, that long break before we could fly over there it was about sort of three or four months. I was able to pricey his book very carefully. So I immersed myself over it many times and knew roughly, you know, what the story was and how the questions I would ask. But uh, on the first day, he, as I say, he was a bit wary, and uh, you know, he's he's very very meticulous about everything he does. So he's examining us as we're preparing and then asking him questions. And of course, I revealed my ignorance by st staggering over the the Goddamarang, or some of the pronunciations were not quite right. And so I saw him looking a little bit sort of. Hmm, and he finally stopped the interview and he said, you don't know that much about opera, do you? <laughs> it, was a, it was a quite stark challenge. And I sort of thought, well, no, uh, but we know a lot about filmmaking. So you'll be telling the story. It won't be us. Um, I didn't say that, but that's what I thought. But we got over that, that hump. And the next day that he came back, something had happened overnight. Uh, and he suddenly was far more charming and, and helpful and, and whatever. So we were very pleased when we had finished uh, that, that interview with, with Richard. He gave us so much that to, be, to be grateful for. And even then, I didn't quite understand how good his, his storytelling was until we put it together and saw how much he held the whole story together. Mm, yeah. So with one interview in the bag, um, we came back to Adelaide and started to think, well, where do we go now? Because we really didn't know who else to talk to. Uh, we were aware that Marjorie had pretty much been forgotten, um, certainly mainstream society. So, um, Wayne, you connected with an old friend. Yeah, well, so the challenge for us was we were here in Adelaide, so everything's happening over in Victoria and, 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 and Sydney. So that was a bit of a challenge about how we're going to actually get into that uh, to that group of people. And uh, we sat for a few days thinking, and then I remember I did know one person connected with opera, and that was Anthony Steele, 
who was the, I think, inaugural um, director of the Adelaide Festival of Arts back in the 1970s, maybe 1960s. Uh, and I had met him at one time through a friend. It was a chance sort of introduction to him. And we didn't get along too well at the time. I remember we were arguing about Wagner and Nietzsche or something, I think, and, uh, and, and so we had a misunderstanding. or well, No, no, just a dis disagreement. Um, and so I hadn't seen him for 20 years, but I thought he's our only bridge to the opera world. So I contacted him and uh, I said, we're making a, a documentary about Marjorie Lawrence and we need to get to, to meet some people who might tell us about the story. He said, well, well, I don't, I, I know of her, but I don't remember her. I didn't meet her or anything like that. But he said, look, you should contact Stuart Maunder, who's the artistic director of, uh, of Opera SA, and he might be able to help. Well, suddenly, with Anthony Stills name behind us, I could get an interview with uh, with uh, Stuart Maunder, and uh, he uh, presumed, I guess, that we knew everything about opera and were connected because we knew Anthony. Uh, and so he immediately said, look, you've got to talk to Brian Castle's Onion in Sydney. Uh, there's John Bolton Wood down in Victoria. Uh, so I can give you contacts and introductions to them. And he says, I know that Brian Castle's Onion is a great Marjorie Lawrence fan. So suddenly this is, all became very exciting. And so we, we booked uh, 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 tickets to, to go to, uh, to Sydney. And there was a particular uh, aspect to Marjorie's story that was of interest to us, and that was uh, her connection with one Charles Buttrose, um, because of course uh, his daughter Ida Buttrose. And we we cheekily thought, you know, could we could we contact Ida and have her in the film? That would be amazing, wouldn't it? Um, and. Wayne but she here. was the head of the ABC, and uh... and yeah, we're in Adelaide, and she's in Sydney, and and how does one contact Ita Buttrose? So how does one contact Ita Buttrose? Well, I didn't want to just make a call to the ABC because I would have been fobbed off basically, and they said, "Well, who are you? What do you want? You know, write it down, send us a note." Uh, so I I I thought I looked up Ita on the um, internet, and it's it turned out that Charles Buttrose, her father. Uh, eventually developed dementia or Alzheimer's uh, towards his later years and so after his death she had uh, helped very much with the with the Alzheimer um, Association uh, as, a, as, as a charity and she would she would donate her time and whatever and so I contacted them and said look we would like to do a story that involves Charles Buttrose and we wanted to get to Ita could they give us a contact and they said well they couldn't do that but they would contact her for us and see whether we could then uh, make a contact with Ida. So they did that and then gave us a contact, uh, uh, which was just the number for Ida at the, um, at, at the ABC. Uh, but now we had an introduction in a sense. So when I did ring, her um, assistant, uh, executive assistant, was a girl from Adelaide. So she was very, very friendly towards us and said, I will put, I'll tell Ida that you'd like to interview her about her father. And she came back and said, Ita would be delighted to, to talk about her dad and, uh, and Marjorie Lawrence. Mm. So we couldn't believe <laughs> our luck. We that. thought that we're on the right track. This is going to be, this is working out all right. Mm. So we arranged to fly to Sydney for three days. So we were going to see Ita on the first day and then see Brian. It had a day in between just in case anything went wrong and then see Brian on, on, the, on the third day. And this so. was uh, November 2020. Um, and as our, our uh, trip to Sydney drew closer, it looked like Adelaide was about to be put into a, another a lockdown um, over a weekend. Yes. Um, it was, they weren't sure, things were just kind of taking off. Um, but we had our trip booked and we thought we've got to go, even if we get stuck in Sydney and we can't come back, this is really important to get these interviews with Ita and, and Brian. Um, so off we went, I think it was on a Monday. Yes. Um, and then by Wednesday, so we'd been in Sydney two days, Adelaide goes into a lockdown and we can't come home. Uh, we're essentially locked, locked out of Adelaide um, for the duration of this, they were going to have a five day lockdown. Uh, so we went along to the ABC um, on the second day that we were in Sydney and it was amazing for us too two you know very simple people from Adelaide with our little well not simple but our little <laughs> not New South Wales yeah our little uh, camera and you know backpack on my back and a little <laughs> tripod and um, and off we go to the the ABC in Ultimo 
um, up to the eighth floor, up to the boardroom, um, which is where Aita's office is, and uh, met with her PA, Lauren, who was lovely. Um, she said, oh, we'll do the interview here in the boardroom. Um, and then she started kind of making us very nervous because she kept saying, oh, well, Ita will come out in about two hours and she may come through this door or she may come. <laughs> and I don't know, it was like the Queen was about to arrive or something. And so we were aware that we were in the boardroom and just on that side of the wall there was this you know, mythical creature, Ita Buttrose. Um, so we had two hours to set up the shot. Um, so we agonised over that for the for two hours and tried to, you know, get the get, light right get and it get perfect. the You only get one shot at this. It's a pretty plain boardroom. So. Yeah. And, you know, all of the films that we'd done prior to this, um, we were interviewing elderly people in suburban homes, um, with the exception of a couple of people, but, you know, they were, they were ordinary people. So this was our first foray into someone who was on the eighth floor in a boardroom. Um, so um, she, you know, we waited and waited, and finally the doors flung open, and uh, and, and in really comes <laughs> Ida in this beautiful pink dress. She and burst in. Burst in. <laughs> that's right. And she had insisted that she has her own makeup artist. So we were on a tight budget, but we had to pay five hundred dollars for the for the makeup. Um, so that was a bit of a blow. But she looked sensational, and um, at first she was maybe a little bit wary, but then we started chatting and. Uh, and then we began the interview and she just loved talking about her dad you know she she was enthusiastic and she was full of information uh, quite intimate information that nobody really else uh, nobody knew um, and she had a great love for her dad so this was an important uh, moment in his life where she uh, where, where, where he, he ghost wrote uh, uh, Marjorie's interrupted melody uh, biography so we had a really lovely time. She was mm -hmm. enthusiastic. She told us lots of great stuff and treated us with uh, great uh, friendship and uh, and kindness too. So that was the thrilling start mm -hmm. to And whole... she surprised us in that she turned out to be a big Marjorie Lawrence fan herself. So we thought we were just going along to interview her about her father who had ghost written Marjorie's autobiography. Um, and here we find she grew, she'd grown up with Marjorie yeah. and watched that film and many many times. She even used the words that oh Marjorie was part of our family. You know we would listen to her all the time um, as a family, and we we all sat down and watched Interrupted Melody together. And she said, you know, we, I still watch that today, and I think of Dad and the family. And um, so we didn't know that she was going to be so intimately connected. Um, so it was a nice surprise. Mm. I think so. When we when we got there, we had to delay the interview with uh, with um, with Ita for a day because of some circumstance, and then that messed up our timing with uh, with um, uh, Brian Castles because we were going to do him the next day. So we asked whether we could do the following day, and he said, "Look, no, I I, I won't be in the city then because he lives about two hours out of Sydney." Uh, so then we were suddenly in a bit of a dilemma um, because we wanted to 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 uh, get Brian's interview. He basically said you could probably I could come in next week uh, because I've got rehearsals to do. Um, but we were booked to go go back. But uh, so we we thought about this and decided we've just got to stay in Sydney for another five days and hope that he'll be available at some time next week. Uh, so we were staying at the uh, lovely Avonmore uh, on the park, a boutique hotel in Randwick, and it's it's like a 19th century um, villa. It's beautiful, uh, but we were the only people staying there because of, of COVID once again. So we asked the, the the owner, could we stay for another five days at maybe a, a reduced rate? And he was delighted that we were staying on. So instead of paying, I think, $200 a night, mm. we got it for 160 So we, we had to change our flights, uh, which which was okay because we couldn't have got into Adelaide for a little while. And we sat around and waited for five days, four days or so. And then Brian said, look, I'm coming in today. Do you want to do it? And we said, yes, of course, rushed over to meet him. And um, that was a thrilling, ex exciting moment, wasn't it? Yeah, so we interviewed uh, Brian at, at uh, Opera Australia at Surrey Hills, I think, yes. I think in uh, one of the, the big studios there. So he just finished a rehearsal and came again, bursting out. <laughs> the people in Sydney like bursting wow! out. <laughs> um, uh, all the way through editing this film, uh, I came to call Brian the human exclamation mark because he's just wow all the time um, and put him next to Richard Davis, who's very <laughs> measured and specific, and, and Brian was the complete opposite. So no, it, it, worked beautifully. It, they, yes, yeah. it worked beautifully in the edit. But um, 
Yeah, the interview with Brian was just as surprising as, as Ita. So we knew that Brian was a, a collector of Marjorie Lawrence material and he'd actually gone to all the trouble of, of putting out this four CD set, um, which I think is still available. I've seen some copies all, on eBay. All, of all the music of uh, Yeah, Marjorie. all the music of Marjorie Lawrence, so four CDs. And this became really important to us um, in editing. Um, all of the recordings you hear in the film have come out of this book. Uh, out of this CD, so there's a nice little booklet with pictures of Marjorie. Um, and some biographical detail as well. Yeah, so it's a summary of her story. So um, he was just so important to our retelling of the story um, because of his passion, um, not only for music in general, but for Marjorie. He's absolutely in love with, with Marjorie. So the more voices we could have in the film of love and admiration, I think it made made it much better. So film. we had that comparison of Richard being always diplomatic and very, very measured and and thoughtful, and and uh, and Brian, who was like a, a bonfire going off every now and again and called a spade a spade, clearly. Um, so they, 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 they worked off each other perfectly, I think. Um, but Brian was full of information and uh, Told us a lot from uh, the music, from the conductor's point of view of how good Marjorie was, and uh, and like I'm sure anyone who's who's read the book and got to know Marjorie, you, you can't help but fall in love with her. And Brian was hopelessly in love with her, um, and, and lovingly, you know, he gave us lots of uh, lots of information and uh, details. Uh, so we had a, a tremendous interview with, mm. with Brian. We were so excited when we, we finished and came back to Adelaide. We thought, wow, we're really on the journey now. Mm -hmm. um, so then uh, by January 2021, so last January, about a year ago, we headed off to Victoria. We were able to get across the border at that particular time from South Australia, um, drove across and headed to Winchelsea. So we knew we couldn't make this film without visiting Marjorie's hometown. Uh, we knew that when we met the people of Winchelsea, we'd get a, a real clue uh, as to Marjorie's personality as well. Um, so Winchelsea, uh, for, if you've not been there before, it's just outside of Geelong, um, kind of in the lawn. A little bit north lawn, of lawn. Lawn yeah. area. Um, and the, the highway from Mount Gambia through to Melbourne actually cuts straight through Winchelsea. So it's, it's a divided town. But as you approach Winchelsea on the highway, on the right is the Old Globe Theatre, um, which of course is the theatre that Marjorie's father built in the 1920s. And it's the theatre where when Marjorie came back to Winchelsea in 1939, um, where she first performed. Um, and there's some beautiful footage in the, in the film of Marjorie returning to Winchelsea and the reception she got there. So as soon as we saw the Globe, um, you just understood so much about Marjorie's like story. <laughs> and when you walk into the Globe, um, if you're ever down that way, I really recommend dropping in and just going into the Globe because you can still feel Marjorie there. And it's a tiny stage. And to imagine this woman who, you know, was at the top of her game in 1939, you know, direct from New York, um, to, for her to be standing on that tiny stage, um, yeah, the, there's still echoes of it today. So we, we found some uh, great footage from Getty, uh, a movie tone news, uh, and about when Marjorie came back in 1939 to begin her Australian tour, the first tour. She had made a promise to her dad that the very first place she would sing at would be in Winchelsea at the Globe Theatre uh, to honour uh, that promise to him. Uh, so the footage shows the whole town coming out to meet her and they rode with horses and, and carriages and whatever, or escorted her into town. The whole town turned out to greet her and uh, it was a marvellous occasion and the footage really captures that uh, completely. Um, we, Richard had said that he had gone down to Winchelsea sometime, but I think he made a quick trip and didn't. Um, he wasn't all that impressed with what was going on there at the time, but that might have just been a, a particular era. We met with Ken, Day, Ken um, Daniels, who was the president, uh, and he was from, I think, from Sydney uh, or Melbourne, one of the two, but so he was running quite a good ship then. So we met all of the people at the Historical Society who had they collected so much memorabilia and detail about Marjorie's life uh, and they were all in many of them in their 80s and 90s so we did some lovely interviews with with those uh, historians and one in particular was Kevin Bennett 
So I think he was, what, 90, was he? In his mid-90s, mid, yes, yeah. and he'd been 15 years old. He was 15 when Marjorie came back in 1939, so his, his memory um, of, of Marjorie uh, was very clear, um, and he tells the story in the film of, of, of being a 15-year-old lad and not being allowed in, so he's looking through the window and got to kick up the bum um, to get away from the window. Um, so again, to meet people like that, I mean, it's just priceless. It, just to hear Kevin and also Shirley speak from the Shirley historical Leak. society, yeah, it, yeah. it gives you an insight into Marjorie, because um, Marjorie never lost that, that Winchelsea, Dean's Marsh aspect to her, I think, and, and so there's elements of listening to Kevin and Shirley speak. You can, Which I think is that's why she's so loved by everybody, because she's not pretentious in any way. That's right. Um, but so she was born in Dean's Marsh, which is about another 10, 15 minutes away from Winchelsea. So we went to Dean's Marsh as well and filmed the front of her house, which is still there. It's a cute little town. Um, and we also uh, went to St. Paul's Church uh, nearby where um, Marjorie's mother uh, played the organ and where Marjorie became the, the lead singer for the, um, for the, um, for the chorus. Is that right? Chorus? Choir. Yeah, choir, yep. choir, sorry. Uh, so that was great to get that footage um, and to get a flavour of, of the area that Marjorie came from. It, it, it meant a lot. Uh, having done that, we then headed off for to Melbourne uh, to do a couple of important interviews. Yeah, so we uh, caught up with uh, Mick, Mickey Oikawa. Mickey Oikawa, yeah. Yep. Who is the uh, president of the Wagner Society in Victoria. Um, and she was very kind to come along um, to where we were staying and give us a, a lovely interview. Um, her voice, when it comes up in the film, it just it's helps to balance light. out yeah, yeah. the blokes in the film. Um, and you know, her she brought such knowledge, knowledge yeah. and understanding of the aesthetics of, of Wagner, um, which we hadn't managed to capture yet um, through any of our interviews. So it was um, a very important interview um, and... Yeah, just added so much to. Could I yeah, could yeah. I remind you of one 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 thing that uh, when uh, I probably talk too much about money because as a producer, money's on my mind all the time about whether we're going to survive doing these things. Uh, but we we went and stayed at the uh, the Windsor Hotel uh, in Spring Street. So anyone who's stayed there, it's still like a nineteenth century beautiful beautiful uh, place. And we'd stayed there before. And I think you have to pay about two hundred dollars a room, I think, but in back away from the from the main the main street and whatever. But this time I approached them and I said, "Look, uh, we're coming over to make a film about Marjorie Lawrence, and if there's any way that you could help us, because it's, it, we're on a tight sort of uh, budget, um, we we would give you some sort of credit." And to our surprise, they put us in the Duke of Windsor suite which was like six glorious rooms with a, a dining room and a lounge room. And, you know, it, it was just absolute luxury. I think it used to be 600 or or $1,000 a night or something, but we were getting it for $200 a night. Um, that was a wonderful thing that uh, the Windsor Hotel did for us, and we appreciate it. And that's where we interviewed Mickey when she came. So I think she was very impressed as well. But then one other strange thing happened too, was that we were in Spring Street having breakfast one morning, and uh, feeling very happy about how everything was going. And uh, we had a breakfast. I think the breakfast would have cost us maybe about $40. But when the waitress came out and I, and, and I said, who do, we, who do we pay? And she said, you don't have to pay. I said, no, for our breakfast, we want to pay. She said, no, no. Somebody just walked in off the street, a, a, a woman, and she paid for your breakfast and said, I don't want to be identified and went. And, she, and the waitress said, I've never seen anything like that before. And we looked at each other, but we must be on the right track. I mean, somebody has just walked past us and then paid for our breakfast. So that was a, a very nice, and Melbourne, staying in Melbourne that time, I think it was like pretty much in some sort of lockdown because we really had the town to ourselves in, in a sense. Um, so that was a really great, great um, uh, time in, in Melbourne. Yeah. And, and we could drive into the city too because it wasn't <laughs> without there any wasn't, traffic. It wasn't, it wasn't a lot of traffic too. <laughs> so we we conducted a couple of other important interviews while we were in Melbourne. Um, firstly, John Bolton Wood was kind enough to uh, grant us an interview. So John has been a an opera singer all his life. I think he's retired now, but does a bit of teaching. Um, so that was fantastic to catch up with him and get the perspective of Marjorie from a, a, a singing, singing expert. Yeah. Um, and. Of, 
another another huge fan of Marjorie Lawrence. Um, so so that her name is not out there uh, as it should, but those people who who know her just absolutely adore her enough, you know, to cover you know a hundred people. Um, so it's it was lovely to see, and it was lovely that we could capture all these people in the film um, and their passion for Marjorie. Um, and then before we left, uh, we caught up with a, an elderly gentleman, uh, Alan Clark, who had been a, a performer, a singer, um, and he was in his 90s, um, not in the best of health. Um, but Wayne had caught up with him on the phone before we'd gone to Melbourne, and he told you some wonderful stories about Marjorie. He was absolutely crystal clear, and they were personal stories, and he was the only person we were going to interview who, who knew Marjorie personally. And so we were really looking forward to, to catching up with him. Mm. But he took a turn for the worse um, over Christmas. And by the time we got there in January, he had lost a little bit of his coherence. Uh, and he died sort of a few months afterwards. Uh, he, tell, he told us the stories again and we interviewed him. And there were some good clips in there. But in the end, it wasn't quite good enough to fit into the story and so we we felt terrible about that in editing that we just couldn't quite fit it in um but you know as i say then he passed away and we, we told his wife that um, that we we couldn't we couldn't do it but we sent her all the footage we'd filmed of him uh because he was so generous with his time and, and a great archive he had mm. and that personal story of um, of being on stage because she was uh uh, wheelchair bound at the time and I think they were playing Aida mm -hmm. and uh, sh she needed four men to carry her on a platform out on the stage and he Alan was one of those people and she loved his his singing and she invited him to come to America uh, to on a scholarship but because of his commitment to work and whatever he couldn't ever take that up but fascinating you know a glimpse of of Marjorie from from his eyes mm. Yeah, but that was that was later on. It was nineteen fifty, wasn't in the, it? When in that, the, so it didn't quite fit in with our story frame. Yeah. yeah, and she sent Alan a Christmas card every year for for many years after they met. So that again reveals the kind of character that she was. She she really had that country essence um, yeah. and that warmth yeah. um, to continue sending those cards. So he had them all. Um, in his archive, it was extraordinary to see yeah. you know, every year a Christmas card from Marjorie and Tom. So we returned home, um, and this is January last year, uh, and we thought we had enough enough material now to, to start editing, so we, we did uh, in this very room. We we begun the long, arduous journey of editing. Um, if anyone's ever done any video editing before, you know that it's, it's a long process, or it can be, um, but it's a, a wonderful art as well, and I always liken it to uh, sculpting. So a sculptor will always start out with a, a block of stone, um, and then they just begin you know, blocking out very rough detail um, and then you gradually use finer and finer tools uh, to get the shape and editing is the same, you, you keep going through drafts. So I think we did maybe 12 drafts of the film um, over a, a three months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's long. So the first version comes out at about three hours um, and it's unwatchable. Um, but you just have to do that. And, you know, anyone that's gone through that artistic process understands. Yeah, you, you get trapped of, because the book was so detailed. You want mm. to put all those details in the book and then you realise he puts a thousand details in the book, but we can only use a hundred. So it, it, you just have to trim it down and lose things. But that's mm. the hard decision making you have to mm. make, don't you, to, that's right. to tell the story. So. But I guess one of the, the first things was that we knew that uh, Richard had told us that there was some footage uh, of Marjorie Lawrence on This Is Your Life, both in Australia and America. So in Australia, it was a 1977 version, which Richard had, and we had a look at that. But it was very late in her life, only a year or two to go, and, and it, was, it was not a particularly good production. But we knew, or Richard knew, that this 1955 version of, um, of This Is Your Life in America was somewhere, but he couldn't, he couldn't locate it. Mm. So he set it as a task for us. It was almost like a holy grail uh, and moment. And Carol's where... got a PhD in research, so this was a challenge. <laughs> um, so, you know, as we start editing, I think we've got to find this This Is Your Life footage. It's got to be out there somewhere. And, of course, YouTube is a great resource, and uh, pretty much every single old episode of This Is Your Life is on YouTube or in one of those classic TV archives. But of course, there was no Marjorie Lawrence um, anywhere. And uh, but I never give up. Um, so mm -hmm. I kept looking and looking and eventually it came up in the library at UCLA in California. 
um, why it's there, I guess, because of the film school. They've got, yeah. Um, and I thought, I'm going to throw this back to Wayne because he has a bit of a history with UCLA. Yeah, so I'd studied there in 91 and 92 and um, it really enjoyed the UCLA culture, campus culture. Uh, so I, I once Carolyn had clued me up that it was in the UCLA archives, I got the phone number for, for the archive and I rang them on the landline and um, someone answered there and they said, yes, we do have that episode, but you have to be at on the campus to, to, to look at it. Um, and by so the way, we're closed because we're in lockdown. <laughs> yeah, and, and we couldn't travel. So I said, mm, that's a bit of a problem. And I said, look, I, I studied at UCLA and I really enjoyed my time there. And, and, and you know, I, I love America because I know that Americans love Australians. So I, pl- I laid it on a little bit thick. And she eventually said, look, what I might be able to do is uh, contact the, 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 the person who owns the footage and then maybe I can put you in contact with them. Which she did, and she rang back and said, "Here's here's where to contact the person who who uh, has the rights to it." Uh, so then I contacted him by landline again, and uh, we told him that we're making this documentary, and he said yes, he'd be willing to to sell us some footage. So he sent over a DVD of this half hour program of Marjorie Lawrence and all of the great figures in her in her life at that time, uh, and that. That episode was watched by 60 million people um, throughout uh, America, so she was very, very famous. So we couldn't believe it when we saw the footage. Um, we were gloating with 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 Richard and Brian because they were desperate to see it as well because they had the Holy Grail. They, so we we then started putting some of it uh, into the film. Uh, just it was a time coded version, and so we would to put it in, see how it worked, and then asked. Uh, the owner in in Los Angeles how much would it cost for for this time so maybe we can just show Mm. a little piece of it now yeah so we wanted to use it sparingly um, so that you appreciate it every time it comes up and it's so important to the film because Marjorie's there and you just when she laughs in that the first (laughs) clip near the near the beginning I mean you just get her straight away you understand her her personality yeah yeah, um so we'll just show you a a quick segment from later on in the film um this is the segment when Marjorie is slowly recovering from polio Um, so she's now wheelchair bound um, and she's just deciding trying to work her way up to being able to sing again and she tells the story of how how this happened Um, so we'll just take a quick look at this just with that okay here we go it was totally inaccurate marjorie confirmed that she never, after the film came out, that she never attempted suicide. Mm. She's probably lying there. I think you're going to have to. Several weeks thinking, you know, I want to die. And then suddenly she thought, uh, no, I'll, I'll find some way to use this as a vehicle to maintain a career. One day when she was at her lowest ebb and said something like, what are we going to do now, Tom? Tom said, well, let's just wait and see and trust in God. And Marjorie took those words literally. And she says that she and Tom renewed, if not their religious practice, then at least their faith, and that that faith supported them for the rest of their lives. Christmas time, 1941, your husband persuades you to sing from your wheelchair at a church service in Miami. Now, how did he talk you into that? Well, it was Tom's church, you see. It was his church in Miami. And he said as a favor to him, if I just would sing once more or once again in his church for himself and for his family. So I agreed to try. And I shall never forget that because we went to church and it was the first time that I sang and I had to sing through a wheelchair. And I was put up right next to the pulpit. And I sang the Lord's Prayer and Ave Maria. And the whole congregation burst into applause. And it was like applause that I've never heard any place else. And Tom said that I was doing it for him. But after I knew that it was just the first little step in the long road back. It's a 40 minutes. I 
guess it was um, um, a watershed moment for Marjorie in that it both offered the opportunity for her to sing in public again, but it also meant that she had to summon the courage to appear in public and to sing again in public. So you can see how valuable that footage was and there were a number of pieces when her brother came on uh, uh, and that was interesting to see. Also when they introduced uh, Thomas Tom King, her husband, um, we had photographs but we didn't know what his character was like but you got a sense of it when he comes out. And then there was um, some other footage further on with... Um, when she did her return, a, 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 a charity, what was was more it was a comeback, a comeback mm -hmm. at, at the at the Met. At the Met. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they had um, uh, Johnson, the uh, Edward Johnson, Edward Johnson. Yeah, the the uh, person who ran the the Met, and he was on This Is Your Life and said what a great night that was. Four thousand people packed the Met, and they gave her the biggest ovation that she'd ever he'd ever seen, and and, and said how sorely we'd missed her. So those were just absolute gems in Marjorie's life that had never been seen in Australia before. Um, so it was so lucky to do. Mm. So we were basically getting towards the end. Uh, we had edited it down pretty tightly. Carolyn did a fantastic job of uh, smoothing over all the pictures and making some into colour that were originally black and white and just giving a lovely uh, soundtrack to the whole thing. I... Uh, did a, 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 a guide narration for the whole thing. It was fairly reserved, but just to give us a sense of timing and whatever. So then we thought, who are we going to get to, to narrate this documentary? And we'd had some experience in using someone of note, a celebrity um, with our previous film, the legacy film. Uh, we had Gary Sweet uh, do the, the narration. He actually came here into this room, <laughs> my place here. Yeah, <laughs> you, you had gooey eyes. I couldn't believe it. What a surreal God. moment that was. Um, and what a lovely person Gary was. So he came and he did the narration and that helped us to get the film on television. I think um, it's played over the last few years on Remembrance Day on SBS. Um, so we knew that we needed someone of note um, to put their voice on this to be the narrator. Uh, so we went through a, f a few different um, actors. Um, and Noni uh, Hazelhurst, yes. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we, about her. yeah we thought Noni Hazelhurst might yeah, be good. Greta Bradman. Greta like, Bradman. Mm -hmm. uh, so we went through a few names. Uh, and then Wayne goes, what about Dame Kira Tagunua? <laughs> And I'm like, and we thought, yeah, but right. we had sex with Ita, we had uh, success with Ita Butros, so there was a chance. I remember I rang Richard Davis and I said, "What do you think if we got uh, got um, Dame Kerry to to narrate it?" He said, "That would be brilliant. I would advise, yes, do that definitely." So and then... Brian had worked. Brian Castles Onion had worked with Dame Kerry in the final years of her career. So you know, he said, "Absolutely, yes, yes, she would be fantastic." So um, to contact um, Dame Kerry, I did some work on the internet again to find out uh, what was going on, and she apparently had a charity in New Zealand which uh, people donated money so that she could help young singers coming up. So I contacted, I had found a number, and I contacted the uh, manager of that charity, and I said, we, we were doing this documentary, and we would like Dame Kerry to, to narrate it, would that be possible? He contacted Dame Kerry and said, yes, she would be delighted. And uh, I said, you know, how much would that cost? And he said, she doesn't want a fee for doing it, but she would appreciate it if you gave a donation to her charity. And I said, that would be fine. Uh, and so... So she said the only, well, he said that the only thing is that she's not going anywhere, so you'd have to come to her. To New Zealand. And yes. of course, with our luck that we've had on this project, there's a New Zealand <laughs> bubble, a travel bubble, so that we can fly from directly from Adelaide to Auckland. <laughs> Which So we, we basically booked a flight the next day. It was very costly. And then we jumped on the plane uh, and headed off to New Zealand. Uh, we arrived at midnight or something and then headed to a, a small motel just across the uh, the bay on the north side. 
next morning early jumped into a hire car and drove for four hours up to the top of uh, of the north island to where um she she lives and it was a it was a treacherous journey wasn't it it was it was uh, hard work <laughs> uh, but when we got there we finally arrived at her place and these gates open up into her compound uh, basically and there she was Dame, Dame Kerry, greeting us with some pea soup and some toast. I thought this is a cup surreal. of tea and a piece of cake. Like, what, yeah, uh, what a lovely human being she is. You know, it was so delightful to be in her presence. I never thought that would ever happen in my life. Uh, we we had some lunch with her, and she had a friend there as well. And then we sat down to do the narration, and I found out that she had for three days been rehearsing the narration to get it uh, just right. So that's how enthusiastic she, she was. We sat down and she narrated the whole thing in one take. I sort of thought there were a couple of things we could probably muck around. I, I think, don't do it. It's Dame Curie to Kanawa. So um, we, we, were, we said, thank you very, very much. And, uh, and we spent a bit more time with her and then off we went. And we just couldn't believe our luck that she had done this for us. And I can only tell you it opened so many doors um, uh, in terms of getting distribution and to getting publicity. Uh, and just her sweetness is, is given that, well, what happened is when we came back and put Dame Kerry's enthusiastic uh, narration on the, the whole thing, it changed all the timing of all the scenes because my dry sort of held back thing wasn't, wasn't sort of the same. So Carolyn had to re-edit all of the, this tiny edit moments to make it fit with her voice. But, you know, she didn't just give the narration. She said, it was sensational. You know, she gave it a real operatic sort of larger than life feel. So what a great thing that was. And, to... um, she told us while we were there, um, she said at first when I you know, got the request to do this narration, she said, why would I want to do a narration? You know, I don't do narration. <laughs> <laughs> and she, she was going to say no to us. But then she watched the rough cut of the film that we'd sent through and she saw so many parallels with Marjorie's life and her own that she said, I just have to do this. This is kind of meant to be and I've got to do this. And um, both of their careers started with the, the Sun Aria, Aria, Award, yeah. Aria Award and there were many others. So she, she just felt a kinship with Marjorie, even though she hadn't heard of Marjorie before. Um, so it was another another little sign that this was meant to be and that we're on the right journey and just the fact that we could get there. And she'd just returned from London. I think she'd been living over in England um, during the, the main uh, part of the pandemic and uh, she'd just got back yeah, um, from, to, to New yeah, Zealand. Amazing. So we were blessed and, you know, she loved the end result. And So, you know, when we started out, we thought, oh, this is just a little film. We haven't got much money. We might be able to get it on television. Suddenly with Dane Kiri on board, we sent it to Natalie Miller at Sharmil Films and she said, we love it. And I couldn't believe the hearing that. And she said, we're going to give it a distribution around Australia. Uh, and then what's it? David Stratton gave us a review in The Australian and said four stars out of five. It's a great documentary. And he then listed it in his best films for 2021. So I can't help thinking a lot of that is Dame Kerry. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and we couldn't believe the success that it's had since. Um, so what a wonderful, wonderful journey. So it shows you, you know, us stepping into the opera world uh, without any background, basically. And what we've learnt over the last two years and the world that's opened up to us of, of beauty and, and, and grandeur uh, and the, the sheer theatrics uh, and, and drama of, uh, of opera. So we've become fans now and it's been a, a, a wonderful transition. So we're as happy as Larry. Hmm. So that's just about it from us. So any questions, comments? Hope we haven't gone too long, Esteban. <laughs> no, you're, it's, no, no, I just have to say that, that um, hearing the the background or the backstory to how you you made the documentary and and the connections that you made along the way is is fascinating it it, it puts the film um in a completely different uh, light um but um no um, anyway yes questions from anybody Just now that you now that you jumped into the operatic world <laughs> <laughs> <who's> <laughs> well okay I... specifically specifically now that you've jumped into the wagnerian opera world who's next <laughs> <laughs> well well i don't i don't know um uh 
Suggestions. Uh, we'll I take guess, suggestions. I guess Dame <laughs> Kerry would be a good. Well, yeah. Dame Kerry would be a good story to well, tell. Not really Wagner, but I know oh, that well, much. Well, that's true. That's true. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. The thing with with Marjorie Lawrence is that that she she is a she is a um, almost unique in in that there are very few young singers in their twenties that. Um, dive into Wagner as kind of like their first forays into into the professional operatic mm. world. Very few singers do that. They usually do some of the lighter stuff and then build up to up to Wagner. She just went straight in, which it makes her a freak. There are very few in, in certainly in the 20th century, very few singers that do that. So yeah. um, for and that it's, reason, Wagner is a very sorry comment. Yeah, yeah, I was just going to say, and you remember when she went to New York and she was going to do all of the, 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 the ring cycle and she had to translate the whole thing into German. And, and I mean, she had a prodigious mind as well as a glorious talent. So she was an extraordinary human being, I think. And the story, I guess, from, from singing Wagner in French and then having to switch to German. <laughs> to learn it all in German, <laughs> which yeah. she wasn't familiar with. Yeah, yeah. Oh, what an amazing person. Mm. Well, the funny story is that's in the film, of course, is that when Marjorie went off to Paris after winning the Sun Aria competition, she didn't know French and she didn't know who Wagner was. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, let's talk about starting from the, the bottom. There's hope for us yet. <laughs> oh, look, no, there's, there's, there's no, um, there's no, uh, uh, there's no time limit or age for getting into opera or Wagner. Everybody's welcome. <laughs> I think that Florence Ostral would be a good one to pursue. Because she has been forgotten, hasn't she, to a certain extent? Yeah, there, there are numbers of Australian singers who've been forgotten. And and Brian Castle's Onion, in that um knows most of them. There are various Roger Neal in London is a great specialist in unknown Australian singers and he's spoken to us before. Um they would have some idea of of the footage and the material available that mm. of who might be good to pursue. Mm. And speaking of Brian Castle's onion, he actually met Florence Ostral and has quite a bit of her memorabilia as well being a collector. So Right. Y yes. Wow. I on. think quite by I'll, chance. I'll, I'll get I'll get off my Austral bandwagon <laughs> momentarily. <laughs> Yeah, look, there are there are a number of us. I mean, there's my, my neighbour Laura Elms, who who is um, who was in in um, premieres of operas in in London in the in the forties and fifties, Poulenc and Britain. Um, so there are there's a whole list of Australian singers who who um, are worthy of a. Of but a was Marjorie particular particularly special? Just with the accolades that she got, and you know, she just really was at the top. And to have a Hollywood film, um, well, I mean, how many Australians have, have had a Hollywood film about them? I mean, that's extraordinary. Hmm. Yeah, she's, I mean, she's she's incredible in that she's the only soprano or uh, or uh, or held in, held in soprano to actually have uh, ridden a horse into the. <laughs> into the so she holds that record. I don't think that anybody's going to take that away from her. And. Um, you know the uh, re uncovering the story of uh, Marjorie, or whether it's it's Florence or or, 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 or whoever. And um, one of the things that Carol and I are guided by is is um, David Williamson, the playwright, Australian playwright, at a conference once said. Uh, I remember he said to me that uh, you know it's important that communities tell their own stories rather than receiving stories from somewhere else because it enhances the community and builds it up. And so we do that. We love telling Australian stories, particularly ones that have been forgotten, like like the Cods Rowers, for example. They had been completely forgotten forgotten because they were working class, but, you know, they were the greatest rowers in, in Australia. Um, so we love doing those stories that enhance the community. And with the Cods story uh, about the rowers, uh, Murray Bridge, uh, once the story appeared on TV, suddenly got um, a, a two million dollars to build a new clubhouse for the rowing uh, for the rowing um, community down there, and they also put up a statue to the to the Cods rowers. So when you tell stories about your community, it has other things that come about, and we would like to see with Marjorie Lawrence 
some sort of um, thing at, at, uh, in Winchelsea, you know, either an annual competition or at least some statue and memorabilia of Marjorie uh, there. So it becomes a mecca for young singers uh, or celebration of opera. Um, so hopefully that will come about over the next year or two with a federal grant or something like that. Yeah, the Americans have, have this ongoing program of the American century where, where they actually do these documentaries very, very well. Mm. Um, and I think this one, if, if we ever had a, a, an imaginative and, and, and engaged federal government that actually <laughs> care about <laughs> the arts and, um, sorry, I'm not being political here, uh, <laughs> about the arts or, uh, or the, the, you know, probably it's the wrong word to use, but it's the only one that I can think of, the patrimony of Australia, and, and, and this one fits right into, into that. Um, yeah, well, we're, we're only a trillion dollars in debt, so a little bit more wouldn't hurt, would it, at this stage? <laughs> All right, I'm being conscious of time. Um, are there any, uh, there's a, a, a comment from Robert oh. Woodley about uh, that Marjorie Lawrence is actually alternating with Kirsten Flachstadt at the Met. Um, yes. Now, yes. Kirsten Flachstadt for Wagnerians is, is she's a, she is a god, a goddess, sorry. Um, so you can't get any better than that. An interesting story there, Esteban, is that uh, Marjorie was asked to go to the Met a year earlier than she went. And because she turned it down, Kirsten Flagstaff had a chance and she became then the, the recognised um, uh, great uh, Wagnerian. It's a pity that Marjorie never really sang at Bayreuth, which is... Yeah, yeah. Politics. Um, <laughs> politics. Uh, yeah, and, and, and I guess once she got polio, it was a bit difficult to... to and the war. Yeah, yeah. and the, the war, war. yeah. yeah. Oh, another one would be that would be interesting is the Australian who did sing at Bayreuth, Norma Gadsden. Now that's ah. a really interesting story. Has that is there a book a book on that or on no? Her? But there's there's a whole lot of footage on there's a whole lot of detail on um, there's a historical Australian um, Facebook page and there's vast amounts in trove. She actually turned Wagner down for <laughs> dinner. And, <laughs> and threw his flowers into the fire. <laughs> and she was related to the Gadsden uh, packaging factory um, family. So she came from a, a rather wealthy background. And, um, and that was a very sad family story. <laughs> uh, that's all on, all on trove, but th that's one to consider. Mm. Uh, isn't Trove a fantastic thing? Carolyn mm. sings the, the praises of Trove all the time. Oh, it's wonderful. It's just mm. brilliant. And mm. there's so much about our singers on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, you know, it's a free uh, access. So in America, you've got to pay for all of those stories. Mm. It's, uh, it's shocking. Mm. But what a wonderful thing for Australia. It is like a time machine because to read the, the language that they used back then and to it's it's just such a great resource. We used a lot of Trove articles, obviously, for Marjorie and uh, for our previous films as well. Um, it's, I love using that as a, a major element of what we do. Yeah, uh, it's magical. Well, check out Norma Gadsden on Trove. Norma Gadsden. And... Oh. There's there's vast amounts, very sad story, but but very interesting. Okay, thank you. All right, um, it's almost ten past eight. We've gone over time, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, um, I think unless there's any other questions or comments from anyone. Yes, can we can we just Esteban? Can we just find out why the film wasn't shown at a more accessible uh, theatre? in Sydney. Like, yeah, look, I, I think that, um, I think because it was a documentary, uh, there was probably a question mark as how strong that would be. Uh, so Natalie Miller is an independent producer, Sharmel Films, but she's been around for a long time. Uh, so I think she had all of her network really in Melbourne uh, and, and country Victoria. And she had some connections um, in, in Adelaide through Palace uh, Nova. But it seems like there's a bit of a hole in Sydney that she, she maybe can't get into there. And so that's why it ended up uh, there. But do, we, we didn't know at the time. Do uh, you have a cinema in Sydney that shows the uh, Met Opera programs? Yeah, it's, it's yeah. through Palace. Um, yeah, well, so that's what... The, the Orpheum at Cremorne shows those. Yeah. 
Yep. Well, that's curious because um, she's got the yeah, rights yeah, to so all the Mel, programs. Yeah, so That's why she took our film on because she knew that she had an audience for. But I presume opera. each cinema operator decides whether they'll take it uh, or, or, or yeah, not. Okay. So yeah. I guess she did the best she could, and also in COVID times, all of the audiences were down, so it, it was marginal about um, mm. what would happen. I, I, you know, I haven't really taken it up with with Natalie. I was just grateful that she did the release of the, of the film because she has to put money up for all the advertising and all that sort of stuff. Um, so I think I wish it could have been a bigger, but I I give, forgive a lot because of COVID. It's it's and changed, it was Christmas as market. well. It was released um, everywhere else. I'm not sure why why the Parramatta screening was delayed. Everywhere else it was released on the 16th yes, of December. Yeah. Um, but so I think maybe a lot of the cinemas were taking in the big Hollywood things that everyone's been holding out for for a mm. while. So uh, and maybe what our cinema release was was just to prepare for trying to get a sale to the ABC so that hundreds of thousands of more people might see it in Australia. It's a tricky business distribution, uh, I, I guess, because our previous films got on television, but this one to suddenly get onto cinema, we 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 mm. went where we could. I. I suspect that it probably will end up being shown on either ABC or SBS at some stage. Yes. Um, but it'd be good for, it'd be good, I don't know how we can, through our networks, how we can help this out, but maybe if we make some noise. Um, yeah. yeah. Those people that, that refuse to, to go west of Oxford Street um, to come to Parramatta <laughs> to see this film. Um, we, we, yes. Yes. Just on that point, we received a delightful email from uh, uh, somebody who had been to see the film in Melbourne and he said, I'm really deeply moved by the story. I loved all of the detail about Marjorie's life and why hasn't she the story been told before? She said, this is a film that the ABC should have and show to Australians everywhere. He said, I'm going to write to the to the head of the ABC and ask that you, they, they purchase this film. And I said, oh, good luck with that. Thank you. And then he sent me another email a day later and said, I've got a reply from the ABC. And they said they're already talking to the distributor about buying it. So I said, well, well done. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, so, no, I think should have been able to arrange that. Yeah. yeah well, she, yeah. she did actually ask us when we interviewed her. She said, will you be offering this to the ABC um, first? Uh, and we decided not to do that. Um, and I, think, I think we've made the right decision. It's been nice to have it in cinemas on the big screen. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, and sometimes it's hard approaching the ABC as an independent mm -hmm. producer. You know, they treat you well. I, well, I won't. <laughs> Marjorie, well, they, treat, say, they treat Mar everyone like shit. So yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. And even though uh, Ita had said, "Why not send it to us?" When I did contact her office about sending it, she wouldn't. Uh, take part in it herself because that would compromise her so she yep. gave us the details of who to send it to but if I sent it to somebody I don't know and then all the panel who are judging films they look at it and they're all journalists and working for the TV station all of a sudden there'll be an Australian story or something on Marjorie using some of our, our yep. research yeah. Yeah. so I just thought it's better to do it in cinemas first and lift its profile, and then you come up with a better position when you approach the ABC. That's a good idea. Yeah. Um, I think from from uh, Alistair Big and and Mike Mike Day have, have asked whether whether it might be possible for to have a, a viewing for the society for in Sydney at the Goethe Institute whether that's possible at all. Um, that would be a great thing, uh, Esteban, and Mickey's just held a screening in, in yeah. Melbourne. Yeah. So she approached me and I said, look, contact Natalie Miller and I'm sure she can arrange something. And she did. So they had a, quite a successful screening just uh, on Sunday, I think it was. So yeah, if I give you the details for Natalie, if you contact her, then I know that she'll want to do something and to help. Oh, great. Okay. Yep. That'd be great. Super. And, and, and it's so great to see it on the big screen compared to, you know, a small screen. So we had the screen, the premiere in Adelaide, one of the premieres, and it was on the big IMAX screen. So it was just <laughs> extraordinary to see it that big. <laughs> Showed up all our flaws in our, yeah, in our documentary. Right. But... And, and if you turned the sound up to 12, then yeah. uh, I think you'd have a really big experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Look, um, I might, um, I might, I might bring this to a close. So, look, Wayne, um, 
and Caroline, thank you so much for your time and 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 for the for the backstory. It's, it's fantastic. I think everybody's really really enjoyed it. And and if you, and and those of us that have seen the film, I think it, as I said, it makes a lot more sense, or the connections make a lot more sense now. And, and mm. so those of you that haven't seen it, well, stay tuned. Let's <laughs> come to a a cinema or a Goethe Institute near you. So thank you very much on behalf That's, of thank you. Society. Thank you all for your support as well. Really makes a difference. So thank you. Great film. Thanks so much. It was Thanks. lovely seeing you. Thanks thank you. you very right. much. Thank you. One one yeah. final reminder. Um, our next our next event, which is our, the first concert of the year at um, at uh, Mossman Art Gallery uh, on the thirtieth of January. So be there. And Ross is showing. I might just make Ross. I can't make him bigger. No, I can't. Ross is showing the tuba. We're very close to getting to our fifteen thousand. So. Oh. with your hand in your pocket <laughs> and don't <laughs> all right everybody thank you very much and thank you thanks guys thank you take care bye bye